This week, we have two interviews. First, we welcome David Kennedy, founder and CEO at TrustedSec, to discuss investing in the right technology and resources. Then we welcome Sandra Toms, vice president and curator, and Britta Glade, director of content and curation from RSA Conference to preview what's new at RSA Conference 2019. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Weekly. Do you have a website, an external presence, employees, an office? Any of these things can be compromised and attacked. How are you defending your assets? Have you penetration tested your public assets? Start 2018 by taking a proactive approach to securing your vulnerable areas. Black Hills Information Security has been helping companies find their weaknesses since 2008. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com and see how they can help you sleep better at night. How much confidence do you have in your security program? TrustedSec is a global information security consulting firm created by Dave Kennedy with some of the industry's most respected professionals. Their team works collaboratively with your company to improve security regardless of its current maturity level. TrustedSec offers an ever-growing list of customized services including red and purple teaming, software and hardware security, incident response, PCI, and risk and maturity assessments. You can visit trustedsec.com forward slash security weekly to learn how TrustedSec can become an extension of your team. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. This is episode number 116, recorded February 4th, 2019. I am your host, Matt Alderman, here in Colorado, joined by my co-host, Paul Asadorian in G-Unit Studio in Rhode Island. Welcome, Paul. Hey, thanks, Matt. It's good to be here this week. I see you got your Edelman jersey on to celebrate the Super Bowl win. That's right. It's a glorious day, the day after we win a Super Bowl. Great game. Great game. It was. Well, sorry. All right. It was kind of boring, yeah. actually. <laughs> it was a defensive battle. It's okay. So what do we they got? They say defense uh, wins championships. That's right. It was a serious defensive game, for sure. Yes. Join us April 1st to 3rd at Disney's Contemporary Resort for InfoSec World 2019. Visit infosecworld.misty.com forward slash security dash weekly and use the registration code OS19 dash secweek for 15% off the main conference or world pass. We do have a number of interviews scheduled with confirmed speakers across all of our shows. So please tune in to learn more about topics that will be covered at the conference. Also, we will be recording at InfoSec World 2019. If you're interested in booking an interview or briefing with Security Weekly, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash conference requests to learn more. Also, check out our on-demand material. Some of our previously recorded webcasts are now available on demand at securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. All right, let's start with our first interview today. David Kennedy is the founder and chief executive officer at TrustedSec. Prior to TrustedSec, David was the chief security officer for Diebold Incorporated, a Fortune 1000 company with locations in over 80 countries. David is also the founder of DerbyCon, that great event down in Louisville every year. If you want to learn more about TrustedSec, you can visit securityweekly.com forward slash TrustedSec. David, welcome to Business Security Weekly. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Who who scheduled a, a Monday before uh, or right after uh, the Super Bowl, by the way? <laughs> right. It, it is a Monday every Monday, except for when we're usually at a conference. So it's the way did it you, is. Did you see there's a statistic that uh, over 17 million people will call off sick today? It's called the, the Super Sick Day. It's yep. the largest in the entire year. It's awesome. Hey, I don't yeah, know what we'll you guys... billions in productivity. I don't know what you guys, but I feel great today. I feel great as well. <laughs> I went to bed at 10, 10 o'clock. <laughs> Dave, I had, uh, Matt, before we dive in the, I had two questions, Dave, for you. Uh, the first is I just, I wanted to talk about DerbyCon. Um, I know my set, you know, it's a long running conference. This is obviously, as you've announced, the final year for DerbyCon. I just wanted to give yeah. you a chance to address the audience uh, and tell them a little bit about this year's DerbyCon and, you know, moving forward. 
Yeah. So, you know, we had a good run. We almost lasted an entire 10 years. Uh, so we've been nine years and, uh, you know, it's been a good run. It's been an amazing conference. Uh, a lot of amazing folks that we've gotten to meet over the years and just inspirational stories that you get to hear about uh, how they were able to find employment or started their career in research. I know uh, we, Matt Graber came up to me uh, in one of the early uh, early derby cons and one of the most respected researchers out there today. And uh, I was like, hey, I'm looking at getting into information security. And I kind of sat with him and worked with him a little bit. And uh, lo and behold, a couple of years ago, he actually keynoted DerbyCon and, and, and started their career. And that's really the whole thing behind the conference was mm-hmm. to get everybody together, to share collaboratively, to, uh, to respect one another and to understand you know, where, you're, where you're going in security and to, to help build your careers up and uh, just share your knowledge. Because everybody's experience is, uh, is what we wanted to, to hear because those experiences make you unique. Uh, based on who you are, where you're from, the, the, the experiences that you had in security and growing up through that. Uh, it just was an awesome place to collaborate. And, uh, you know, year after year, it starts to take a toll on you. And uh, running a conference that grows uh, large in each and every year, I mean, we, we started in a pizza shop and uh, it turned into this massive undertaking where, you know, it was taking six, seven, eight months of our, our time mm-hmm. uh, every year. And uh, my wife is the one who essentially runs DerbyCon behind the scenes. Uh, she runs everything, like the coordination, logistics, the finance, the the sponsorships, uh, everything you possibly can imagine. She's literally the the uh, the the organizer of DerbyCon uh, and and runs everything uh, like that. And just was a lot. And you know, we have kids that are ten and eight, and uh, just a lot of sports and things like that. So you know, we decided uh, to let's just make this our, our last year and, and go out with a bang. And, and uh, we're already under the the well well under the planning stages right now. And we have uh, some pretty amazing surprises and. Uh, the band list, I think, is going to be pretty awesome. But uh, all in all, it's nice. going to be more of a nostalgic event to uh, to talk through what now, DerbyCon Dave, was and, and Dave, leave our last impression. Dave, you've you've three kids. Just a reminder, you've you've three. Well, they're they're, I know, they're twins. They're, they're the same age. I know. I, know. I, have <laughs> <laughs> I cover both of them with one, but uh, ten and eight. Ten and eight are the are the, are the twins, and then the uh, the oldest. But uh, tons of sports. I had sporting events all weekend. Oh, I know. And, I hear you. Yep. scouts and lacrosse and everything else you got to do so it's uh, it's a lot of fun i love i love this time of my life and we decided you know we want to be there with our kids and and watch them grow so uh, dave you called me up uh before DerbyCon won the first one and said yeah. i need your help anything you can do show up to the event speak whatever i was like yeah dude uh and it's been an amazing run uh since then i've been to almost every DerbyCon. i missed the one with Method Man and, and Red Man, my two Which favorite. Which is probably one of the best rap- ones you've ever had, by it's the way. But. Two of my favorite rappers probably in the whole world. So uh, uh, yeah. maybe the opportunity will present itself where I get to meet them at some point in my life. It's on my bucket list. But uh, yeah, if you called me up, I would. So for those that don't know, Dave and I have known each other for a long time. So yeah. when Dave calls, I answer. And you know, we either have a great conversation about something not security related, or he's like, hey, can you come help support DerbyCon? And I'm like, yes. So hopefully well, it's there's funny more when opportunities. We first did that. When we first did DerbyCon, uh, it was it was one of those where I pulled every friend card I possibly could, right? Mm-hmm. Because um, with the, the the expenses of a first time con, and we kind of wanted to go big, we needed about three hundred people to break even, or yep. else we'd be having to do a second mortgage on our house. Yeah, and uh, and so you know, I go up to my wife. I'm like, "Listen, I want to start a conference in Louisville, Kentucky," and she looks at me like she normally does when I have these ideas, and so mm-hmm. she thinks it out and, and is like, "Well, you know, I'd like to help with this, I'd like to help manage." I'm like. Oh, I can't imagine anybody else who could do that other than you. And, uh, and so we all, we all started working together to, to create what DerbyCon was. And I called all my, all my friends and I called you, I called, uh, Nickerson HD, mm-hmm. I mean, a, lot, a lot of great friends that just, just came together to really make sure that the conference is, was successful. So I can't thank you enough and everybody else that, uh, made DerbyCon what it was. It's, it's definitely something special that'll go in my heart forever. Now, Dave, it's interesting. We've talked a lot, you and I, uh, in the past about various roles that you've held about DerbyCon, um, but how you started trusted sec i don't think i've i mean we haven't really talked about that in any and you kind of brush it off like yeah i got this company but it's a pretty sizable company today dave you've grown a really uh, significant company in the meantime of doing all these other great things like open source projects and yep. conferences and speaking so tell us a little bit about how you started trusted sec and grew it to where it is today yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think between Trusted Sec and Binary Defense, we have 147 employees or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we do work with uh, three of the Fortune 5 and about 70% of the Fortune 1000 companies out there. And it's just uh, it's been an awesome testament uh, to, to trying to build a company and do the right things. And that's really where, where Trusted Sec started. I was working at uh, Diebold as their chief security officer. And I had a team, I had a team about uh, 63 employees, I think. And, and it was weird because we literally had full reign to do what we needed to to secure the organization, uh, all the way to the CEO, to the board of directors. I mean, we had no hurdles whatsoever. If I asked for it, I got it. It was like a perfect life. Like I, 
literally you don't hear information security folks say like, hey, this is like the best job I've ever had. Usually they're stressed or they're mm-hmm. overworked or you know, they don't have enough resources or fun. I, I didn't have any of that. And uh, you know, it was interesting. We built the team. We built the, 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 the group. And uh, we had a great relationship with IT, the business. We were making changes at a, a super fast rate. We we're implementing things that hadn't been done before. I think we were one of Cisco ICE's first customers uh, with implementing uh, 802.1x on the switch port levels uh, with na- network access control mm-hmm. and just doing all this really cool stuff. And and I, one day I went home and I was driving home from work and I just felt like I wasn't making um, as big of a difference there as I could in other places. And I know that sounds weird because you have a great job, you have a, a, a stable job, you don't have to worry about your, your position. And I just didn't feel like inside I was making the difference that I wanted to, like I was with DerbyCon or uh, with with uh, working at the at the company. I didn't want to work just for one company the rest of my life. And I got, I went home and I thought about it for a while. I went out uh, with a couple of friends and talked to them. And I went home and and most importantly, I talked to to Erin and and uh, my wife. And uh, she at the time had just had twins, uh, so it was a great time to quit a perfectly stable job and <laughs> and do a startup, uh, which is amazing, <laughs> right? You have screaming babies everywhere and. And, uh, and I've everything been there, else. Been there. Not twins, yep. but I've been there. Yep. <clears throat> yep. So you know where I'm coming from on that. And, uh, and so I went to Aaron and I said, listen, you know, uh, I really think that, uh, you know, this isn't really my calling in life of what I want to do. I want to start a company and I want the company to help others and to build a company on people uh, and make sure we treat people right and, and do the things that are right uh, in security to, to, to make companies better. And that's really where start, Trusted Six started. I started in the basement of my house, no VC funding, nothing like that. Uh, and really had to to uh, uh, create a brand new company where I had no idea what I was doing, and and lo and behold, now we do work with the largest companies in the world, and and uh, and we do a great job at it. And it's really the way that our company structured is is to treat people right and to not double book uh, our consultants, to not overload them, to make sure that they're focusing on the customers, that they're uh, practitioners and and experts in their individual areas, that they know what they're doing, uh, and that really has made a difference for us. We don't have the the junior staff models that you see in a lot of consulting organizations where they'll so have one senior that talks a great talk, and then you get you know somebody that's fresh out of college coming in doing your, your your security reviews. It's nothing like that. We really focus on on the quality of work and making sure that we can be the best of the best and only hire the best. And that's really uh, our mindset and what we do and how we treat our people. Our, our folks here, we have uh, we didn't lose one consultant last year at all, zero, wow. uh, which is unheard of in the consulting field. Uh, people here are happy, and we we love what we do. That's awesome. Matt, sorry, I, that's how I wanted to just open up the interview, just uh, those couple of items. So I know you've no, got other topics great. you want to talk about. but Yeah, and it ties into the topic we wanted to talk about a little bit, which is investing in the right technology and resources, which is people. And I think you know the challenge for a lot of organizations is where do they start? And so, Dave, I'd, I'd love to kind of give some guidance here on you know, organizations, you had a great team at Diebold. I did a lot of work at National City Bank back in Key Bank in Cleveland in my career where, where we kind of overlapped a little bit, you know, but, you know, those are well-established companies and, and not everybody knows where to start. So I'd like to start in and kind of help people get an idea of, hey, how do I start building a security program? It's a great question. I think uh, overall, the the biggest uh, problem that we face in the security industry is is understanding how to build our programs right, and and understand what risk is. Uh, there's a lot of technology out there that can help assist in in building a security program, but when it comes down to it, the security is an augmentation of your people. It's an augmentation of your business and your programs that you have out there. And I think what most uh, security programs fail to do is is really take into account what do I need to focus my efforts on, and where do I reduce my most amount of risk at within the company. And I think there's a lot of, of, of ways that people think that they might be able to sidestep a lot of hard work and effort by augmenting pieces of technology. And don't get me wrong, there's, there's a lot of great technology out there that can help solve a lot of the issues that you have today, but you really have to have a program put in place first. And I think that's where most people uh, really struggle with doing it. And uh, you know, I like to, to put it into an analogy. It's like, hey, we have you go down to a gym and there's some great dumbbells and there's some great uh, uh, jogging equipment and there's some great ways to, to do an exercise, but do you actually... Uh, work out? Do you actually use that equipment in the right way? Do you use it in a way that, that is effective? Do you know how to do proper workout techniques when you're, when you're leveraging a dumbbell? And I think that's where, where a lot of folks really get tripped up on is that they buy a lot of these pieces of technology. It introduces a substantial amount of complexity in their environment and they don't have the amount of resources to upkeep that or to even build those programs out. And that's usually where we see a lot of companies really falter or fail at when it comes to, to information security is that there's so many different things that we have to deal with on a day-to-day basis that it's it's overwhelming. I mean, look at vulnerability management. Vulnerability management in and of itself 
is probably one of the most difficult security programs that are out uh, there are out there. And if you look at breach statistics, um, you know, the, a CV of two years or older is typically the ways that that hackers break in in most cases uh, when when they're when they're targeting specific infrastructure. And and so you know, if that was an easy fix, well then pieces of technology would be able to solve that. But it's really a business problem. It's a a program problem and identifying and addressing and remediation components of that. So really, I think that the biggest issue that most companies face is understanding where to prioritize and taking a step back. When I when I first got into Diebold, uh, when I was their chief security officer, the the biggest issue we had was patch management. And and the first thing I did when I when I walked into the company is I didn't just start running penetration tests and start implementing pieces of technology. I built relationships with people in IT. I built relationships with people in the business. And I knew that that vulnerability management was probably one of my highest risk areas because of our, our attack surface that we had and being a global company and everything else, uh, that I knew that I really was going to need a lot of other people uh, to be successful in that program. And, and that's really where I started off with was more of the people aspects of it than anything else and, and building up a team that could support the type of load that we needed to do to really address and change the culture of the company uh, is where it really comes into. And I think that's the, the biggest piece is that relying on the people and having the right people in place is, is number one. Yeah. So when you think about a program then, right, you got to kind of back it up a little bit and say, okay, what's our risk kind of profile? What's our risk tolerance as an organization? Then you start to build out aspects of how you want to build your program. And then you got to hire resources to manage aspects of implementing that program because otherwise you you put the cart before the horse in some respects. I think the challenge I had early on was kind of what framework do you use? Uh, this was, you know, when I was doing the work at National City Bank and their third party vendor management program, this was, you know, ISO was around in the early days. NIST started coming out with 853, uh, which kind of evolved through the federal space. Now we have the NIST cybersecurity framework. We've got the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Where, where should people, you know, kind of where are some recommendations about kind of where should people look to identify, all right, if, once I understand my risk, what are some of those different components I want to put in place based on that risk profile? Where, where do they start? Because my guess is it's not at the uh, MITRE ATT&CK framework. That's probably a little too far forward. I agree. And, and I think you hit it right on the head there. Is, is MITRE is more of a, a, a controls test uh, where you're, you're testing controls to see how effective your technology is uh, at, at detecting specific types of threats or protecting against specific types of threats. You look at more of, of, of actual cybersecurity frameworks out there, like ISO, for example, the 27001 uh, series and 27002 controls framework is more of a, an international framework. Uh, and that's more of what you see on traditional security programs. And uh, a lot of folks have been moving off of ISO. Um, and, and, and a lot of folks still use it because it's an international standard, whereas NIST is really centric in the United States. Um, but ISO, I think, in a lot of cases, um, is really, really documentation heavy, which is uh, where I think we've gotten into a lot of trouble. Like everything is, is, is heavily documented, repeatable approaches and processes, which is not a, a bad thing. But documentation becomes hard, especially in cybersecurity, as things change uh, quite frequently. And that's where I really think uh, NIST has solidified its, its forefront as a great cybersecurity framework because it breaks things into individual programs as part of your process at different tiers of maturity, uh, what they call their capabilities maturity model. And the cybersecurity framework, the CSF, really provides a good detailed way to approach risk, approach your program, and break it into five different buckets, essentially, that allow you to uh, look at your program holistically. And, and, and I hate using the word holistically. It's a, I know it's a big buzzword. But you look at identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Um, those are the categories that NIST breaks everything into. And identify really goes back to even some of, some of the basic concepts that we still don't do very well around asset management and understanding your inventory, uh, and understanding uh, what systems you have and what your scope is of your, of your, your cybersecurity program. And so I think NIST brings a lot of different areas uh, to say, okay, well, here's how we benchmark ourselves in our security program. Here's where we're at from a risk perspective and, and, and following that up with, a, with a further bolstered by a risk assessment. Uh, and then leveraging that to, to see what maturity level you are and where you want to be as an organization. Not everybody wants to be at the tier four, which would be like more of the adaptive uh, approach. Um, but, but at the same time, let's continuously get better and let's benchmark that and, and leverage that against what we currently do in those five different areas. And I think that's much more maintainable uh, than something like ISO, for example. And we see customers having a lot more success with something like NIST. But it, you know, usually from a, from a framework perspective, it doesn't really matter uh, what, f- what framework you're using as long as it fits your program and you can build it to meet your needs. Not everything's perfect. NIST isn't perfect. NIST isn't going to be perfect for a unique business that is completely different in every way, shape, or form. Uh, but I think it's a great baseline to be able to adapt uh, to your, your, your program. Now, where I think a, people, a lot of people get, get 
uh, confused at is how do you leverage uh, something like the MITRE attack framework in that, in that type of program? And what MITRE is, is completely different from what a cybersecurity framework is. Uh, there's a lot of buzz around MITRE, and there's a lot, there's a lot of great reason for that. Uh, there's a lot of great things happening with MITRE and the MITRE attack framework specifically. But what we found is that most companies, when it comes to both their preventative controls and their detective controls, fall behind very quickly. And it's very difficult for them to have the staff, the team internally, to be able to understand attack patterns in their environment. And so if you look at like what we call the tactics, techniques, and procedures, or the TTPs of, of attackers, how they, they compromise systems, how they move uh, into post-exploitation and move to different systems to exfiltrate data, um, data analysis around that becomes very important. And, and getting those, those techniques that attackers leverage can help understand how effective your controls are around the investments that you have in technology and your people. So let's just say we just bought this awesome, amazing SIM and as UABA and, and an artificial intelligence and it it automatically stops hackers in its tracks and it, it completely protects that. Well, do we know that that technology actually works or does it really need to be augmented by humans to get the value that we need out of it? And how do we effectively test that? And where the MITRE attack framework comes in is they have a, a whole subset of, of different areas all along the different um, types of, 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 of uh, phases of an attack, everything from exploitation and different types of exploitation to persistent footholds, uh, lateral movement or post-exploitation scenarios, credential harvesting, things like that. And it essentially provides a list for you to be able to go through and say, well, does this work in our environment? If it does, can we either protect against it or can we defend against it? And you start to build more of what we call like a balanced scorecard around your capabilities and how mature you are in there. So, so something like MITRE really plays well into the capabilities maturity model um, within the National Institute of Standards Technology, the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework, the CSF, really into the uh, detect, protect, and even the respond uh, components of that uh, to really see, hey, is our technology working the way we intended to? Where do we have gaps in that coverage and where can we get better at and continuously focus be on being more proactive at preventing or detecting uh, specific attacks? So very different beasts. Uh, I think they're kind of used in conjunction. You don't want to have the MITRE attack framework be the, the sole purpose of how you do things or even really to gauge how well you are doing against detection and protection. It's really a, a series of checklists. Some of them are very vague, like, hey, you need to do you know, ACLs and do network segmentation. Well, okay, well, what does that mean and how do we build that into our into our risk model uh, and, and our threat models of our organization to be able to productively respond to that. And I think um, that really helps with that. And one last thing I'll, I'll say on the minor attack framework side too is a lot of those um, systems it, it, or a lot of those, those techniques that you try and you, you test, it's really hard to go through them and understand which ones are really applicable to you from a risk perspective. And I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes with the minor attack framework is, hey, we're in this industry demographic uh, you know, we do this type of work and we're in these types of countries. This makes up our threat model and understanding who our threats are towards our organization. What should we really be prioritizing from and what should we be focusing on? And that really comes from your cybersecurity framework or something like NIST to be able to build your threat models out to understand where your highest level of risk is at in different locations or which programs are more risk, uh, risk centric in our environments. Uh, that's really where, where something like a cybersecurity framework like ISO or NIST comes into play to really help you prioritize and categorize those uh, to help you get better. Have, having a plan is, is really important, and it doesn't matter whether we're implementing security technologies or infrastructure technologies, just having a plan. And also, in, when you're developing that plan to implement technology, having those things Matt and, and Dave were talking about of understanding your risk is huge. That may, you know, do I need to spend all this time like securing this one port on this one switch and spend hours on that? Well, probably not. If you look at your risk profile, you can come yep. under the acceptable amount of risk. Right. I mean, it's really in summary what we're talking about here. Everything is about balancing risk. Uh, the, the world does not revolve around cybersecurity in any way, shape or form. Businesses do not revolve around cybersecurity. We are a cost center in most cases to, to every single business. So it's a matter of what's our budget? Uh, what can we do to reduce as much risk as possible? And what's our highest probability or likelihood of this risk impacting our organization? And let's focus on those. It doesn't mean that, that, that that's the right call. It just means that based on the information that we have, these are our highest risk areas that we have to be able to build plans around to try to reduce those risks for the business so that they can operate appropriately. And when those fail, the ability, and that's where you know something like, like the NIST cybersecurity framework um, comes into the respond, the detect, respond, and recover. How do we detect those specific deviations where maybe our risk didn't handle something appropriately, we have a compromise, um, or our system's been infected with ransomware? How do we respond to those threats and have a good 
incident response plan or a way to handle those situations to address those exposures or those risks towards our company? And how do we recover from incidents that we occur? You know, having more than just information security as a communication standpoint, you know, corporate communications, uh, legal, um, all those different environments, those all come into play to things that we've been trying to build for a long time within organizations around handling very specific areas. And one thing that we do um, over at Trusted Sec that I think is, is really beneficial is, is trying to understand that whole program of, of where a company's at in their maturity and say, okay, well, you may think that you're a, a tier three, for example, but you're really a tier two based on these areas. And here's really where a lot of your high risk areas come into play. And here's where you need to focus your roadmap on building out over the next several years uh, of trying to address those risks. And it really helps, I think, having an outside perspective to be able to do that. A lot of times I know when I was at Diebold um, as their chief security officer, I'd, I'd get a, a very myopic view of, oh, I need to focus on vulnerability management. But then, you know, I'd have somebody come in and be like, wow, they totally destroyed us in these areas I didn't even think about. Um, being able to have outside views and perspectives also really helps, I think, craft a lot of your, your program and where you're heading and getting a little bit of outside perspective. And I think the frameworks help provide kind of that roadmap for organizations. Yeah. You got to do the basics, right? You need to identify critical assets, critical data, yeah. what your risk is areas are then then you move into prevention detection response what i see a lot of right now is everybody chasing the response side of the equation yeah. and not focusing back on some of the basics which is why we see still challenges with patching and just basic cyber hygiene because oh well, that's kind of the that's the identity kind of prevention stuff eh, maybe it's not as sexy it's a little more boring and everybody's off building security operations center and building yeah. out their incident response process but it's important to have all those pieces laid out and it kind of lays out the order in which you should do them in as well that's right and i think you hit it right on the head there is that everybody wants to go after the sexy stuff and and they want to detect russia hackers breaking into their environment with powershell injection techniques that load into memory or wmi persistence methods that are using high speed stuff that's never been detected before that's cool stuff right like hey we stopped russia when your domain admin account has a password or password one. And it's it's the basics and the fundamentals that are our highest risk probability in almost every single organization. And those programs are really supposed to be designed to handle the basic stuff. And once you get to that point, once you have a decent level of maturity, then you start to focus on more complex things. You're, you always want to take a risk approach to whenever you're building these programs out, because if you're not, then you're, un, you're, you're basically going for the stuff that's almost unobtainable, that changes all the time. When password management, uh, two-factor authentication, network segmentation, concepts that we've been talking about since the 90s, where Marcus Raynham came with the first firewall and was like, hey, you know, you should do all these different things. All of these things are things that we should be focusing on from a, a long-term strategy and roadmap and getting to while augmenting things that, that maybe are, are quick hit things like, hey, patching uh, specific uh, areas that we know are high risk or critical patches that come out that, that need to be addressed. There are going to be deviations in, in our roadmaps and what we do. And that's really where something like, like the cybersecurity framework or something like NIST can really help you adapt that and, and build that into your program to be able to build those long-term roadmap strategies more strategic level. Then you also have your very tactical things that we can do. Like, hey, for example, let's, let's disable multicast in our environment because it could be used by a responder and, and detect usernames and passwords. Like, you know, like those are very tactical things that might not take a lot of time in our environment, but at the same time may introduce some things that, that reduce our risk in, in some cases in, in, in high zone or high high attack vector um, type type situation. So it's got to be a balance of both. You, you need to have both tactical things that you can do very quickly and have some immediate return on. Uh, but again, that all comes into understanding what your risk is and really being, being able to build those out. And I think that's where a lot of people falter is that the response piece, the ability to detect when in most cases they don't even know what they're looking at uh, because their program isn't even mature enough to be able to do that uh, really, really causes a lot of problems because their program then gets expanded out to five, six, seven years versus two or three when they should be prioritizing things much differently. And I think uh, balancing on risk is an is important part there. And I think it also impacts your whole hiring plan because now you're, it, some of these earlier stages are probably a little easier to find resources for versus the, the SOC analysts right. sitting in the security operations center. They're a lot harder to find. So, you, you know, it, it also affects your hiring plan of where do you go get the right people to implement your program? Yeah, usually, and it was interesting as a lot of these these program centric uh, 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 security parts uh, portions of, of what you're b building out on, whether it's vulnerability management, uh, whether it's uh, you know your your external presence, uh, uh, password management, things like that. 
aren't necessarily massively complex pieces. They just take a lot of time to, to implement. So you're going to be leveraging a lot of your existing teams, your network engineers. Maybe you need to hire another one just to be able to, to handle the, the segmentation components. Uh, you know, the, the vulnerability management pieces. I, I started my career off in, in vulnerability assessments, right? Understanding how vulnerabilities work and being able to run vulnerability scans and then triage those and do confirmations of those. So, so from an from a expertise perspective, absolutely, the fundamental programs, which end up being the highest risk factors, the easiest to staff and, and to obtain, are the ones that we least typically focus on in information security. And I think that's a, a major problem of where we're at today. You, you, and don't get me wrong, there's, there are companies out there that have amazing security programs that, that are in the tier four adaptive component of information security, where a lot of those higher end resources are absolutely needed, especially when you're doing things like threat hunting and, and actively going on hunt teams to identify edge cases or abnormal patterns of behavior in your environment. Uh, there, there's, there's an absolute need for that. But in most companies, I would say at least 60, 70, 80% of them really don't even fall into the line of tier twos uh, within the cybersecurity framework. And so when you look at that, that's, you know, you don't need these, these massive programs that are designed to, to thwart all of the advanced adversarial simulations that you're having out there with, with customized exploits and zero days. Your program isn't anywhere near um, mature enough to be able to handle those types of things. And, and it's not your highest risk factor. So 100% agree. Yep. Paul, you got any more questions for, for, for Dave? Um, <clears throat> I think I'm good. I think I'm good. I've, I have one. I just wanted to make sure. Dave, give some people some recommendations, kind of where to start. Where, you know, it, is, is it literally just start with the framework, kind of assess yourself against it and, and move forward? Where should people start that are start trying to build these programs from scratch? Yeah, I think a good starting point is understanding the cybersecurity framework or NIST as a, as a st standard uh, way. And if you already ISO, that there's no problem there either. Um, but at least having a, a foundational framework that you can leverage uh, to help build and maintain your program in some sort of consistent way. That's that's the, the big issue there is consistency. And so if you look at the different components of a security program, uh, those are all broken out, which is a great way of looking at different areas and components that you have in your information security program. And then really, the, the biggest piece there is, is how do you identify risk? Um, how do you understand what your risk is towards your organization? And I really think that that comes with first understanding what your threat model is um, towards your company and really where a lot of your attackers are coming from or what your real risk factors are. Is that competitors? Is it uh, what, what does your risk universe look like? Is it, is it um, nation states, which only a small demographic of, of companies actually fall into? Uh, is it organized crime? Is it commoditized uh, hackers like ransomware and, and things like that? And, and, and really understanding what your threat, uh, threat models are and then start to build out uh, your, your risk profiles and, and your different programs that make sense. You probably already have established programs in different areas, uh, but really starting to build those out. And I think the, the biggest issue is that we don't know how to communicate what we need uh, and the return that we're going to get uh, from an organization because we don't understand risk. And so if you can make a, a good solid justification for, here's our top 10 most critical areas within information security, Here's where the, the industry benchmarks are for, for staffing for these individual areas. And here's a roadmap of how we're going to build those out. That's a lot different to, to build your program out that way than it is not having anything and kind of starting from scratch. So that's definitely something that we can help with um, or you can do on your own. Uh, but there's a lot of ways to, to kind of formulate and build those out over time to, to really develop your strategic plan and your tactical plans for what you need to focus on to reduce those risks over, over time. And so I think uh, starting off, leveraging something like a framework like NIST is a great, great starting point uh, and, and customizing it as you need to uh, for your own organization. Uh, customizations aren't a bad thing. Uh, there there, there are, are things that definitely don't fit in every single business model. And as well as time and funding, I mean, we might say like, listen, we can't do asset inventory, asset managers just because of the current state of where we're at. So we're going to focus on other ways, other compensating controls or ways that we can um, do things to address risk in other areas because we know that we don't have the, the funds or the staff to be able to do this. I think that's important is to be able to prioritize that, understand that, and start to build that program out. And you start to have something that's a little bit more manageable and maintainable, then everything is on fire. We have all these different things we have to do, um, and we don't know where to start. I think it's a good starting point for a lot of different organizations. Dave, I did Perfect. have one last question. You're on the news quite often, uh, representing the security community very well, by the way, I will say. Uh, Thank you. How did you get involved uh, with that? That's actually that's a funny story on the news stuff. Uh, so I was actually working at Diebold at the time, and uh, uh, one of my friends is Kevin Mitnick. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kevin calls me up. He's like, hey, I can't do this, this interview. Um, can you go on, on uh, I think it was Fox at the time. And by the way, I do Fox, I do CNN, I do CNBC, mm -hmm. I do every single news organization out there. It doesn't matter to me as long as I'm talking about security. And it's a funny story. So I uh, I couldn't I, I called back D, uh, Diebold. I'm like, listen, 
you know, can I get a, a, a approval from corporate communications to go on Fox News to talk? I think it was like about, uh, I think it was actually about DEF CON. It was, it was during Vegas. It was mm-hmm. during DEF CON. And uh, they said, no way. Absolutely not. We need to go through some formal training. We're not going to allow you to go on Fox News. So I was like, oh, crud, that sucks. Um, so I called up one of my good friends, Chris Nagy from Social Engineer. And, uh, oh, I remember Chris, this story. Yep. Yeah, this is good. <laughs> Chris, uh, I've trolled Chris my whole life. Like, like it, it's one of those things where you meet somebody in your life that, that it just becomes a mutual bond and you just troll that person your whole life. And I got stories upon stories about trolling Chris. My whole life has been basically dedicated to messing with Chris. You could write a, a whole win. book. I'm looking forward to your tell-all book about trolling Chris, to be <laughs> honest with you. <laughs> I got some good ones, man. I mean, you look back at my, you know, there's certain things that you're proud of in your life. You know, I'm proud of my kids. I'm proud of my wife. I'm proud of my mm-hmm. life. I, everything. There's certain things that like, I really, really like what I did with Chris my whole life. Like, and you want to laugh. Things. You got to hear Chris tell some of the stories where he's like roasting in the car in the middle of summer because Dave's turned on his heated seat. Like the I, modified, I modified the CAN bus on my, my seat controller so that it, it, it the only option you could specify on the controller is like one through five. But on the, on the CAN bus, the instruction sets you could send to the heat, a heated seat was like one through like 15. It was like literally would, would cause like a fire on the seat. And so he was like roasting on. <laughs> anyway, so I call Chris up and it's like it's like six o'clock in the morning in Vegas on like a Saturday. And Chris had just getting, got, got done giving us his, his training uh, course. and. Um, so his voice was really raspy and uh, he hadn't slept. He went to bed at like two o'clock in the morning. So I kept calling him. I kept calling him. Finally, he picks up and he's like, hello. I'm like, Chris, hey, listen, man, I got, uh, um, uh, I got selected to do Fox News, but uh, my, my uh, company won't let me do it. Would you be interested in, in going on Fox? And he's like, and then he hangs up on me. <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm like and I call him back again. I'm like, Chris, I'm seriously not joking. I'm like, get down here. He's like, Dave, I'm seriously tired right now. If I come downstairs and I don't go on Fox, I'm going to be extremely upset. I'm like, okay, man, you're all good. So he comes downstairs fully expecting this to be a massive troll. So he's in like some really wrinkled shirt and he like <laughs> got bags underneath his eyes. I've never seen somebody have so many black bags underneath their eyes before. I mean, it was, it was incredible. It was literally looked like he stole out of bed, didn't shower or anything like that. He's got a shave, you know, he didn't hand shaved. He looks, looks like a total rugged hacker um, at this point. And they, the Fox sent a, a limo to pick us up. And so I'm in, in the limo with him going to Fox News. And he still thinks that this is part of a troll that we're going to like <laughs> pull into this building and it's going to be like, he's going to be like handcuffed and we're going to leave him there for like six weeks. <laughs> and so he gets there and, and up until the point uh, of him getting mic'd up, he still thinks it's a troll. And then all of a sudden he's like, ha Davis is really funny. And then obviously he's like, yes, this is Chris. Yes. And he's like, Dave, Oh my God, you're serious. Aren't you? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, dude, I'm serious. And he's like, Oh my God. And he's like freaking out. He starts sweating. He's like, he's like almost ready to cry on, on a thing. And uh, literally, he goes on Fox, and he, he did a great job. But I mean, he was super nervous. So that was the first portion, and then after that, they get your name in the, yeah. the um, in, into into the thing, and you kind of go from there. So uh, Kevin really introduced me a lot to to a lot of that, and it's been a pleasure to help represent the community uh, and, and the information security community and the, and the industry itself. And uh, if there's ways I can always improve, uh, let me know. I, uh, I I enjoy going on there and talking about things that I know about, and not going on there for things I don't know about. Mm. So awesome! Thanks so much, Dave. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for joining us on Business Security Weekly. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. it. You folks are doing awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. If anyone wants to learn more about TrustedSec and their offerings, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash forward slash TrustedSec. We'll take a quick break and then welcome Sandra and Britta for interview number two. 